At Sweater Weather, I'm bringing the best of Canadian left journalism, publishing, and academia to video, where it will find new audiences interested in these ideas. If you like what I'm doing and support my mission, please make a monthly donation at patreon.com slash Canadian Sweater. The link is in the show notes. In your influential essay, The Liberal Order Framework, a prospectus for a reconnaissance of Canadian history, you argue that Canada makes the most sense if we understand it as the ongoing process of a certain politico-economic logic, to wit, liberalism. Liberalism has been dominant, so dominant in Canada that many of its basic precepts you know, have escaped scrutiny. Although perhaps that is changing somewhat now uh, at a time when the system is facing a, a crisis of legitimacy. Could you define what you mean by liberalism or the liberal order? What are the main features of this ideology, you know, of which Canada is an expression? And you know, why did liberalism become dominant here? And could you also clarify what the relationship is between liberalism and capitalism? Well, thank you very much, Aaron, for having me on and for this interview. Um, it's a real delight to share my ideas with other people. In my 2000 essay, and it's hard for me to believe that it's now two decades ago, <laughs> I was trying to get at the way we might overcome what I regard as a really bad habits of Canadian historians and other intellectuals, our tendency to build really formidable silos and engage in almost infinite fragmentation of our field and not talk to each other or read each other's books. And I guess problematize the Canada that we take for granted. Uh, so I then saw, and I still urgently do see, an, a real need to transcend the nationalist social cultural history narratives that are operative in this country's two major linguistic communities to give people a research tool with which we could imagine a more integrative paradigm. So it's a tool. It's not liberal order framework. And I reread re the piece, uh, you know, actually, <laughs> I think there are a few moments in the liberal order article which which do sort of sound like, you know, manifesto for rousing all the troops. And But actually, I'm struck by the fact that, I, and but I would still underline, it's one tool among many. So I would say, you know, other important abstractions, settler colonialism, modernity, capitalism, for sure. Uh, these are all really significant other tools. But I think liberalism is really important as a way of getting at the Canadian dimensions of these experiences. So on this reading, Canada becomes less a self-evident and obvious thing or an entity or a nation as we keep calling it. And it's much more an arrestingly contradictory, complicated and coherent process of liberal rule. And now to get to what I mean by liberalism, I see it as something much, much bigger than a political tendency, a particular psychological disposition. Instead, I see liberal order by definition as one that encourages and seeks to extend over time and space a belief in the epistemological and ontological primacy of the category individual. So in my reading of the liberal tradition, it is centered on this almost deification of this idea of the individual. Not, And the individual in liberal theory is not uh, you and me as people uh, going through our lives, you know, doing what, what people do. It's not, it, it's not to be confused with ordinary people. It's like almost the idealized version of the person we might become if we really applied ourselves to becoming freestanding, self-possessed. Uh, and that, I think, is the, the core of the liberal paradigm. Uh, so I think you really need to make a, a clear analytical distinction between the liberal order as a principle of rule and then the often very partisan historical forms that this principle has taken through 150 years of Canadian history. But you know, it is interesting. If you look at uh, Canadian political history, 
and it has a dwindling number of people who are really <laughs> into it. But if you look at Canadian political history, what would strike anyone non-Canadian looking at Canadian political history is how many parties have called themselves liberal. I mean, John and McDonald's party, the liberal conservatives, uh, Wilfrid Laurier, liberal, 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 liberal. I mean, liberal uh, regimes here have held power for four decades straight in some jurisdictions. So I would submit that just empirically, uh, liberal is a really big word in Canada. And I think it's kind of an insult to liberals just to say, well, it doesn't mean anything. It's just a, it's just a word, you know, who cares? <laughs> People call, well, no, I think that I, I think they're selling themselves short. They really are buying into a worldview, a way of thinking of like, I would call, and I called it in the article and I, I would repeat this. I think it's a kind of secular religion. I think there is a kind of deep, deep faith, an unarguable faith within liberalism that means, as you pointed out in your introduction, it's so pervasive, so everywhere in Canada, it almost is very hard to see it, right? Uh, and, and you know, you, you get yourself in, into these, these positions where people want to say, well, you're not a liberal, so therefore you must be fill in the blank, you know, a, an awful person, a person who's un, against kindness, a person who doesn't want any civil liberties for anybody, you know, a, an acolyte of Paul Pod or, you know, the worst despot that you can imagine that, and, and you know, this use of the phrase illiberal as the antonym to liberal. That's not what I mean, right? I think liberalism is much more like a coherent philosophy of being, much closer to being a religion that has precepts, that has principles, that has ideals that shouldn't be subjected to his time and place. So in the Canadian case, I think, you know, if all liberals affirm liberty as they understand it, and that it has to be core to any liberal, or else they have to give up the name. The, the very name comes from liberty, right? right? So all liberals, I would say, affirm liberty. Most of them would say equality before or the law, formal equality. Uh, but in the Canadian context, our version of liberalism, and I think it's a very pervasive form that we find now throughout the 21st century world, emphasizes a third value, and that is property. I think property more exactly the individual's right to hold property. So I think in that sense, and I'm borrowing some of these ideas from the renowned theorist C.B. McPherson, and I borrowed a lot of his ideas without knowing about it in 2000, and now I'm working on a book about him, and I said, oh my gosh, I really should have footnoted him more. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I keep saying, you know, C.B., you're right on, the, on my wavelength. Well, actually, that's kind of preposterous because I'm on his way. <laughs> I, I had no idea of how much influence I, I, had, I was already going on in 2000 and now I'm really realizing it. But McPherson would say, and I would agree with him, that property for our liberals is a far more fundamental value than liberty or equality. And in a way, property is what buys you liberty. And equality. In a way, we can see that so plainly now all around in our pandemic world. How do you get out of this pandemic? Um, okay, it's it's good to be white. It's good to be, um, you know, uh, not in a major rural, uh, major urban area. It's good to have, uh, you know, all sorts of things we can fold into it. But what's the basic thing that's going to buy you your liberty from pandemic? Uh, it's money. It's property. It's being able to seclude yourself in your own freestanding house. It's your ability to buy your way out of this. It's your ability to, to uh, isolate. People who are homeless, people who are living in cramped tenements, people, you know, nine tenths of humanity don't have that privilege. So right now in 2001, 2020, we're seeing like plainly the centrality of, of property to our conceptions of liberty. Uh, and if we want to make this a fairer system, if we want to say, well, you know, it doesn't seem right that poor people should be dying disproportionately the, uh, of a pandemic than rich people are, well, we're going to have to address that question of property because that is actually the key to our social order. So going back to when it starts, 1840s on my reading, uh, big in the Canada's and the Maritimes initially, and then 
these people are so confident of their worldview. They're so confident in themselves. They have a philosophy. They feel capable of taking that and spreading it across all of the subcontinent of Northern North America um, to people that they don't know and territories they've never visited. They still are quite certain that there is a certain way that one should hold land, a certain way that one should interact with other people. And that is all premised on what C.B. McPherson and I, I guess I now would call possessive individuals, which is this matrix of ideas that are founded on property. Uh, you, the true individual is in possession of himself, and it's always a very strongly gendered uh, conception throughout the liberal tradition until our own time. The true individual is in possession of himself, and as a consequence, is also able to possess the labor of other people, uh, and on and on and on. So if you want to see why we, we so have a, such a uh, skewed system in our uh, world today, it is because of that possessive individualism. Uh, and it is that which is at issue in our own time. So this, you know, I would call it a liberal revolution. And that really strikes some Canadian ears strangely because they say, oh, <laughs> revolutions, that's one thing that we never had in Canada. We define ourselves as being counter-revolutionary. We never had an American revolution. Fair enough. But I say that if you stand back and look at the ways that people conducted themselves before the 1840s, millennia in which Indigenous peoples constructed their societies and their worldviews in ways that were entirely different than this, Ancien regime societies in New France and in the Maritimes where you had notions of uh, order and, and corporate belonging and established churches and uh, stations in life to which people should adhere. These are very different than what the liberal order will give you. And the liberal order in that sense is a revolution. Uh, a revolution that yeah, it's a long revolution. It unfolds from the 1840s to maybe the 1890s, when we can say it's kind of reached a stage of completion. But our core political definitions of the self and uh, how you should act in society and how the state should be operated are different in 1890 than they were in 1830. They're fundamentally different. And I would call that the liberal revolution.